looking at a baby stray, two months old. Really? He was, yeah, he was separated from his mama and his siblings and taken to uh, somebody's house. And they were advertising at our local uh, veterinary clinic uh, for a home. And so when I went to make, meet him at the nurse's home, he was all, uh, uh, he, he was still really, really nervous and running all over the place and frantic and, and so excitable. And we weren't sure if, uh, I wasn't sure if I should bring him home to my six-year-old, to my wife. Uh, we had one cat, actually we had four cats, but they gradually became one cat over 20 years. Uh, yeah. He just died uh, six months ago, the last cat, mm -hmm. 20 years old. This cat went 20 years. And my daughter had known her for five or six years and so was sad and wanted a new cat. And I wasn't sure if this hyperactive, really nervous, really sad, really kind of traumatized new two month old baby cat would be good for her or not. But I came home and I asked her, hey, look, this is the condition with this cat. What do you think? Can you, you think you could nurse him, nurse him to normalcy with some uh, innocent love? And she said, yeah, 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 bring him, bring him. So he's been here for not 10 days now and he is totally adjusted to our family. He's wonderful. I, I couldn't imagine that it would be so, such a short time that he could live in the house of yoga and really, really experience the vibe, really get it naturally from the kid, really get it naturally from me and my wife. But it seems that animals know and that, that uh, they can be healed with a vibe. It's really, really nice. So the magic of yoga, this, this is a great way to apply yourself and you don't necessarily have to take yourself to India to do it. Although it is, it's an interesting place, that's for sure. I spent 20 years there on the path of the yogin. And yeah, wow, and I wouldn't go back. No, <laughs> that, that, that experience is done. The Sanskrit word yoga, it means to unite and it means to yoke. It means to take control of. It means to take control of the mind, this mind that's always running here and there and making us crazy. Uh, yoga philosophy likens the mind and the senses to a team of horses pulling a chariot. And it's up to us, the charioteers in the chariot, to be able to use the reins properly to guide the mind in the place that we, the soul, wanted to go instead of the other way around, the mind taking us, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we being totally unconscious. And this is the peace of mind that yoga offers. Yoga has... 30 or 40 different definitions in the Sanskrit dictionary, but the two primary ones are yoking or controlling the mind or, or taming the fluctuations of this mind and union. It's a union of our consciousness with the greater consciousness that surrounds us. This union of our consciousness with the greater consciousness shows the relationship between us and the nature who birthed us. Just like there's a relationship between you and your mom and dad, simply by virtue of them having created you, there is a relationship between we and the nature who created us. It's a very, very real connection. Just like our body is made of something physical and we live on a planet made of something physical, just as there are fluids flowing inside of our body and there are fluids flowing on this physical rock that we live on, just as we are dimensional creatures, she is a dimensional creature, we are the same. There's uh, an axiom, uh, a fundamental principle that says, as above, so below. As it is up there, so it is down here. We are mirror images, we and the cosmos. And it's this... It's this experiential covering over our mind, all the education that's been fed to us since we were little babes that has blocked out uh, an intuitive knowing, a real knowing, a, a connection with nature. And what yoga does is it brings us into this silent, steady, safe place that allows these channels to be opened again and experience our real connection with nature. No difference between me and you and the guy in Nairobi and the guy in Moscow and the guy in Brazil. 
there's no difference. We're all the same humans of the same nature, all with the same 10 fingers. And, and we all have the same stuff born with the same birthright. And mm -hmm. the evolution to knowledge of our place, our status on this earth is the end goal of the spiritual seekers. The spiritual seeker is looking for this peace of mind that's going to be generated by a particular self-realization. And this self-realization is going to reestablish that connection with nature and allow for a total conscious creation of your life in alignment with your vision of joy, whatever that vision of joy is. Yoga means union and yoking, and the practices of yoga take you in the direction of achieving this union. The yoga that you practice at the yoga studio is called Hatha Yoga, and Hatha means using the body. There is a sage, his name is Patanjali, and this sage's sutras or writings on the topic of yoga are the teachings which every studio bases their teachings upon. Uh, he offered us a system of eight limbs of yoga, including moral and ethical practices, body practices, breathing practices, focus and concentration practices, meditation practices, in order to achieve the goal of perfect steadiness of mind that would allow us to achieve that final synchronization with the greater nature, the union, the enlightenment. In his Yoga Sutras, he talks about the body work, the asana, the postures, mm -hmm. the postures that you take, and the correct postures or the, the needed postures that were necessary in order to be able to sit comfortably. The entire purpose of Hatha Yoga was to prepare your body to be able to sit comfortably for extended periods of meditation. Because if your legs were falling asleep or your back was hurting or, or something, you wouldn't be able to sit in meditation properly. Your focus would be going all over the place. And so we used body yoga to prepare our limbs in order to get ready for meditation. That was the original intention of Hatha Yoga and all of the practices around Hatha Yoga. And some of the studios like the Hot Yoga Studio have turned it into a trend and turned it into a, a health focus, have turned it into a socializing network, have turned it into many different kinds of things, uh, have commercialized it and kind of taken uh, the spirituality out of it have taken the, the real uh, meaning out of it. But Hatha Yoga is one. And the body practices that the sage Patanjali was talking about were only six or seven different postures. There were only six or seven different postures, whereas most studios today, they're running with 20 or 30 or 40 different postures. And, and they're good, they're strengthening, they, they, they address the core, they address flexibility, they add to longevity, they have all kinds of uh, benefits for sure. But the five or six that he recommended were simply to allow you to get flexible enough and comfortable enough and strong enough in your lumbar region, in your, in your pelvic region, uh, in your core to sit comfortably. This was Hatha. Hatha was not only stretching and strengthening, but it was also breathing because uh, according to the yoga sciences, according to the science of Ayurveda, Ayurveda is the Indian science of life. It's the medicine. It's the, it's the healing side and the, the, the medical side. That's their original medical practices is called Ayurveda. It's their herbs, their herbology and stuff. And um, Ayurveda and yoga philosophy talks about the body in five levels. The first level being this physical level, the second level being the prana level or the energetic body. And it was through the breathing practices that we would learn how to modulate the energy that flows through our body. So through these breathing practices, we would 
use visualization along with an understanding that we do have an energy body, that there are meridians. For example, uh, if you're familiar with Eastern uh, uh, acupuncture or acupressure, the Chinese meridians, right? The, it's a body full of meridians and energy points and, and major energy plexus, uh, plexuses. And the breath exercise called pranayama was addressing that second layer, that second sheath of our body. So hatha yoga, this is all talking about this first yoga practice, hatha yoga. Hatha yoga was a very, very body, mind, energy vehicle, oriented yoga, which was preparatory for allowing us to achieve union and synchronization with the greater nature on the way to the main goal. The main goal is Buddha's main goal, right? Nirvana, they call it Nirvana, the, the final answer. And the funny thing about the legend of Buddha is that the, according to that legend, Buddha sat in meditation for seven years. And when he opened his eyes at the end of the seventh year, he said, wait a minute, this isn't the way at all. I've been meditating far too long. No, I, I, I've been living too extreme. This is not the way. And he woke himself up and he called for a, a, a farm girl to bring him some milk. And he got his atrophied muscles massaged and bathed and started living a life again. And then he developed something called the middle way, which was not too much on the stoic side and not too much on the, on the living side, but right in the middle was the birth of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So meditation itself is not the entire thing that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Hatha yoga is a focus on the body and a focus on the breath. And, and there's a real knowledge going on and a preparation for meditation. And we're going to learn a lot through meditation, but it's not the whole thing either. There's also a life side that has to be, you know, experienced. This is Hatha yoga. There's also Bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of devotion. And it's, it's entire different yoga. And then there's Jnana yoga, which is the, no, which is the yoga of knowledge. We, we achieve the same union and synchronization through an application of knowledge and knowledge exercises. There's mantra yoga, which is a chanting kind of yoga. We go into meditation through chanting. Mm -hmm. Different kinds of yogas. Karma yoga, which is the yoga of life. It's being mindful in the life. How you're feeling, what you're doing, what you're sensing, what you're thinking, what you're wanting. Being mindful every second. Karma yoga. Different yogas. Have you tried them all? I am a tantric. Have you heard of Tantra? No. When I went into the Himalaya, I met an ascetic yogi. Mm -hmm. This guy was yes, in answer to your question, yes. Yes, I have tried them all and, and tried them all. I live them all. I am them all. I am yogi and mm -hmm. yoga is my life. And yes, so I am devotional and the body is in perfect order and I know all that. And, and yeah, I am yogi. Tantra is the classical approach to all of the yogas. It, Tantra is the umbrella that houses all of the yogas within its philosophy. That's Tantra. And Tantra is the magic and Tantra is the prayer and Tantra is the, the language and, and Tantra is the practices. T tantra is the whole thing. And, and you'll see in Facebook, if, if you, oh God, don't go search for Tantra. If you go search for Tantra on Facebook, please ask me because there's only one good group that is led by an academic in Oxford an Oxford educated PhD lover of Tantra and, and master of Sanskrit. And he really approaches the art and science with an impeccable scholarship. And he's really, really good. If you go looking for it on Facebook, do. But if you did a search for Tantra on Facebook, you would find 
every sexually depraved character uh, from here to the Antarctica, everybody, you know, back in 1940, there was this guy in America who had created a cult and used the word Tantra uh, to support his ideas of how a cult leader should be related with. Uh, and somehow the word caught on in, in the West that Tantra equals sex. And so now today you have people saying tantric union, tantric sex relationship between man and woman, this is Tantra. It's not. And, you know, of course, Tantra represents the entire life. And so the relationship between male and female or God and goddess or, or, or uh, masculine and feminine principle, yin and yang, it's all there. And there are very high level yogic sexual practices as well, but that's not Tantra. Right? And then that's, you know, one little piece. And the Tantra that has been transcribed into English uh, by some very, very good sages, uh, the, the Tantra that's made its way into the English language is few and far between, actually. The, the really good traditional uh, classical texts that have found their way into English are very, very few. But there's one, there's one, two. There are two really, really good works and they're volumes and volumes. I mean, really, it's, uh, I think, 2,000 or so pages uh, of these volumes. And within that, it's, uh, I think, volume 29, chapter eight, that talks about the sexual practices of the yogini cult of the Brahma Yamala. And, and everybody's picked up on that. And that's because it's the, the five hindrances to self-realization uh, is greed, uh, over-attachment, lust, anger, and illusion. These five are the ones that keep us chained into our habit patterns that stop us from attaining our goals. But, you know, in those five, lust, lust is a huge one. And that has got a lot of people trapped and when you go looking for Tantra on Facebook, you'll see why that is. But uh, yeah, I'm very familiar with the yogic paths. It's fascinating. It really is. It, it really, really is. And that talks to, you know, most of the churchgoers around the world. I mean, who, who can live like the Christ? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, a, what a man that Jesus was. Right. And that's Jesus. And that's everybody else. Mm -hmm. What a lady that Mary was who could see the Christ for who he was. And then the, there were the disciples closest to the Christ. How did they live? And look at the gospels that they wrote after. They're different than the teachings of the Christ. Yeah. Who was it? Paul, who talked about the inferiority of women. How could, a, how could a disciple so close to the master, right, who took in the Magdalene, go after the master's death and talk about the inferiority of women? Look, okay. look how quickly the people get lost, even those who are closest to the master, who received his teaching directly, who received his hand on their brow, touched directly boom he's gone get lost that's how quickly we get lost can we forgive them are we only here to heal the animals do we only feel compassion for the animals these are all of his animals we are all his animals how deep and wide well i mean there is uh a saying, physician, heal thyself first. So there is that. And as you quite well know, there needs to be a peace in your own heart before maybe you can extend that to others too. But, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, this, this path of understanding the way of the world is part of the path of yoga. And the path of bhakti yoga is an examination of the heart. It's an examination of your devotion. 
it's an examination of your compassion and a development of your compassion and it's a kindling of your relationship with God. That's bhakti yoga. If I were to instruct people in the path of yoga, as I do, I always come at it from the point of view of how I was taught. And I was taught without textbooks. I was taught, you know, for 20 years directly, sitting in open fields and drinking tea under the sky. And, and it was a really, really, it was like I was back in the garden, you know, and I really had to shed so many different ideas of who I was to really come back to who I am. But when I introduce people to yoga, now I, I'm studied. Now I know where the source texts are. Now I know the difference between this yoga, that yoga, and the other yoga. But when my master was giving it to me, he was giving it to me from all different kinds of directions. He was giving me the knowledge yoga and the devotional yoga and the body yoga and the magic yoga and the breathing yoga. And he would give it to me at different times because he just knew exactly what I needed. And I don't know, I developed my appreciation for yoga in that way. And now when I deliver yoga in seminars or, or workshops or, or however I deliver it, that's the only way I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to go inside a studio and do only a studio yoga class. I mean, I can, I can. And actually, I've made a couple of videos on that, too, just but it feels like it's just an exercise video. And, and sometimes I try to create different videos uh, expressing just one particular point. And it's it's a real task for me. And I enjoy it. I enjoy the job. And it's it's a really learn. It's a really good learning process for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I take people through it, like in a coaching session. It's uh, an introduction to various practices, step by step, bringing closer to the goal all the time. Sometimes, like my master did for me, you know, sometimes with the breathing and sometimes with the meditation and sometimes with just a little bit of conversation and sometimes with this and sometimes with that. Mm -hmm. That's how I work with yoga. Shiva Shatya Yukto यदि भवति शक्त प्रभवितुं नचे